We heard a lot today about the importance of pragmatism uh, in uh, advancing human rights. And it's something at Human Rights First that we're strongly committed to, trying to find a way forward. And I, I wanted to draw your attention, in case you have not seen them, to the series of blueprints that we have out in the lobby on your way in. And encourage you to take a look and feel free to take them home with you. You can also find them online. Um, uh, we have done, um, we did this in 2008, and we did it again this year, a series of very pragmatic how-to blueprints on a, a range of human rights challenges uh, uh, designed to help people in the incoming administration sort through what steps they can take to move the ball forward. Everything from how to uh, reform immigration detention to how to make the Arab Spring a human rights success story uh, and lots of issues in between. So please uh, take copies of those and uh, and uh, feel free for those of you who are um, watching online to go on our website and, uh, and download them. And thank you all for sticking around for this very uh, important wrap-up speaker. Um, our next speaker is not only one of the country's brightest legal minds and foremost champions of human rights, but he is also a close friend of Human Rights First. Harold Coe was a longtime member of our board. To understand Harold's passion for human rights and international law, you have to know, it helps at least, to know a little bit about his family history. His parents grew up in Korea under abusive Japanese rule. After Korea was divided, his mother and her family hiked for days to escape North Korea. During a brief period of democracy in South Korea, Harold's father served as a diplomat, but when a military coup overthrew the government, he refused to serve the dictatorship, fled to the United States, and was granted asylum here. Harold's father was one of the first Koreans to study law in the United States. He and Harold's mother were the first Asian Americans to teach at Yale. And it was at Yale Law School that Harold established his reputation as a leader in the human rights movement. In 1992, a year after I got started in this field, uh, Harold led a group of Yale Law School students in challenging the unjust treatment of 300 Haitian refugees who had been detained in Guantanamo. Guantanamo is somewhat of a theme in Harold's career, um, even though those refugees had been uh, had qualified for asylum. And as uh, was documented in the book Storming the Court, Harold and his band of dedicated students took the case all the way to the Supreme Court. After ch serving in the Clinton administration, Harold returned to Yale Law School and became its 15th dean. From that post, he spoke out forcefully against the mistakes the United States government made in the wake of 9-11. Chief among these mistakes was the immoral and illegal embrace of torture, which Harold said was devastating not only to its direct victims but to the United States as well. He wrote at the time, quote, human rights define who we are as a nation and as a people. A ban on official cruelty is one of our most sacred values. If we condone it, we gain nothing and lose our identity. Harold now serves as the top lawyer in the United States State Department, where he has been in the middle of important debates over presidential authority to wage war and the targeted killing program. Please don't ask to see his drone rule book. He does not carry that around with him. Harold has written too many books and too many articles and won too many awards to list here. His scholarship, though, is really a touchstone for me personally, and he's had a huge influence on the way I think about the human rights movement and what role Human Rights First as an organization can play in it. If the United States is going to lead on human rights as we're urging it to do, it needs leaders like Harold. Please welcome Harold Coe. <laughs> Thanks, Elisa, and, and it's uh, great to be here. Um, I want to spend most of the time uh, answering your questions, but I thought that given that we are at the end of the first Obama term, uh, given that there will be a second Obama term, uh, and given that um, Secretary Clinton, for whom I've been the lawyer for the last four years, um, is, is leaving, uh, you might ask really what the legacy is uh, that uh, human rights activists and lawyers can take forward. And I think it's a, basically it's, it's five words. Uh, two of them are smart power. She coined and used this phrase, smart power, as a touchstone of what was going to be 
her approach to foreign policy. Uh, at the time, many people thought that this was just a slogan and it had no real content. But if you look at, uh, if, if you pull, put uh, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, smart power into any database, you will find now dozens of speeches that she's given fleshing out a smart power approach to economic statecraft, to counterterrorism, to internet freedom, uh, and the like. <clears throat> and what I think it sums up to is three other words, uh, which are engage, translate, and leverage. And what I want to argue, and I'm happy to address this, uh, is to suggest that this is the strategy that we have been pursuing over the course of the last four years. Uh, engage uh, around our values uh, internationally, domestically, uh, in bilateral and multilateral settings with public and private partners. Second, to translate, uh, which is a difficult challenge. One of the great ironies that I found as a lawyer in the State Department is that we have 21st century problems and 20th century laws. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that most of the laws that we have simply did not anticipate the kinds of technological changes that we face. For example, when they wrote the Geneva Conventions, they, they were not thinking about cyber conflict, which means you have two choices. Choice number one is, or one possibility, is to say that because they didn't think about it, no law applies. It's a black hole. Or these old rules are quaint, to coin a phrase. Um, the other approach is to translate, to try to translate the spirit of the law that exists to the current situations. And then the third is leverage. If you have engaged, if you have argued that legal rules apply and acknowledge that legal rules apply, how can you leverage the role of law uh, as part of a number of other policy tools to achieve certain results? That includes traditional hard power, military tools, uh, development, but also diplomacy, technology, public-private partnerships, uh, and the like. And what I would argue is that more important than any particular issue has been the approach that this administration has taken toward law and its relationship to human rights which is a smart power approach, which means our first option is to engage an attempt to translate legal rules from one setting to the current setting, and then try to leverage our compliance with legal rules into regimes and um, uh, uh, governance mechanisms uh, that can control and drive human rights change going forward. Now, the contrast between engage, translate, and leverage, the opposite of engagement is isolationism or uh, unilateralism. The opposite of translation is to say that no law applies. Uh, the opposite of leverage, or trying to use soft power to gain leverage, is to try to do everything with hard power. So if that strategy isolation or unilateralism, predominant use of hard power, arguing that law doesn't apply sound familiar as a rejected strategy. That was what we were shifting from. And what I want to suggest is that we have tried very hard to, <coughs> um, in area after area, uh, take this different approach, which is, and I'll give you just one example, the case of Chen Guangchen, who received the Human Rights First uh, Award earlier this year. Mr. Chen contacts us. He'd like to come to the U.S. Embassy in China. Um, one, one possible way is to say no or to refuse to engage China about his fate. Um, what we did instead was we engaged both with him and with China. We said, come, to, come on to the embassy. We had a legal explanation that created a precedent for him to do so. He entered the embassy. 
uh, we engaged with the Chinese government about his fate. The second was to develop legal arguments that covered his particular situation. You have to remember that um, the United States has never backed the notion of a right of diplomatic asylum. Um, somebody like uh, Julian Assange has been pleading that as a basis for going into the embassy and uh, the Ecuadorian embassy in London. We were translating traditional legal rules to cover his situation. And then finally engaging or leveraging uh, our engagement with public-private institutions, in this case, uh, Global University, NYU, allowed us to uh, work with that university so that he could study in the United States but continue to engage in advocacy here and abroad. Now, I won't go through it, but engage, translate, and leverage explains what we did in Burma. It explains what we did on Internet Freedom. Uh, it explained what we did on Libya. Libya is a very classic example. Uh, we could have left the Libya situation alone. We engaged. Uh, we tried to do it within a framework of the law, namely two UN Security Council resolutions, a multilateral uh, uh, approach in which NATO was involved, and then tried to leverage uh, our legitimacy and legality of our actions into uh, a combined approach that could address the situation going forward. Now, one thing you can point out is that this has simply made a virtue out of necessity, because what we have seen very graphically is the limits of a unilateral hard power approach to achieving outcomes, particularly human rights outcomes. What is also striking about this approach is it is a return to how the US conducted its approach to international law and human rights at the beginning of the republic. Remember, as by expressing a de decent respect for the opinions of mankind, that the United States sought to become a participant in an international legal system and thereby to promote human rights, both as our core value and as something that we protected elsewhere. And so, for example, we have take the Human Rights Council, engage, translate, and leverage. The last administration wasn't a part of the Human Rights Council. They viewed it as a mechanism that wasn't worthy. <coughs> we took the opposite approach. And now we have been able to leverage our position on the Human Rights Council into work on such things as Resolution 1618, Special Rapporteurs. Uh, we've just been reelected to the Human Rights Council. Take the International Criminal Court. Again, a previous approach was to reject the institution, be isolated from it, uh, express disagreements with the legal norms governing it. We have tried to engage with the International Criminal Court. Uh, I've represented the US at all of the Assembly of States parties meetings at uh, Kampala. Uh, we have supported every ongoing case before the court. We've provided as much support as we can provide consistent with our laws. And it has had a leveraging effect in that we now have a position on international criminal law and the standing tribunal that is much more in line with our attitude toward international criminal tribunals in ad hoc fora, instead of having this kind of disjunction that has existed for this period of time. And then finally, coming to the case in which I, f I find myself always asked, no matter what I do, <laughs> which is, of course, uh, the war uh, against al-Qaeda and associated forces. Many, many people say to me, you know, um, the Obama administration has not changed the approach from that of Bush. And I think that, that nothing could be further from the truth. We have tried to fit an attitude toward detention uh, and targeting into a legal framework. We've tried to translate legal rules from a uh, non-international armed conflict setting, traditional non-international armed conflict setting, to a conflict against a non-state actor. And we've tried to build uh, norms that can be shared and discussed with organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross, 
allied nations were also facing the same set of issues. Now, as Elisa pointed out, implicitly there's more work to be done there. But there's a big difference between an approach to a genuine threat, which operates within a framework of law, uh, a multilateral response in which certain clear rules are stated and which we try to work multilaterally with other nations to achieve various kinds of results. And I would point out there are six very important differences. Number one, we do not use the term global war on terror. That's a phrase that has never escaped my lips. We are in an armed conflict with Al Qaeda uh, and its associated forces, which was declared by Congress after September 11th. As you heard from Jay Johnson earlier this week, that is a conflict that, depending on how it goes, we hope will end. Number two, uh, we do not rely on unenumerated presidential power. We rely on congressional authority, the authorization of use of military force resolution. Number three, we don't say international law is irrelevant to that conflict. We say that our approach is informed by international law. Even when some courts have told us we don't have to follow international law, we follow it anyway. We do not use the term enemy combatant. In other words, we do not approach this from the perspective of labeling people. We uh, identify when people are enemy belligerents who are actually posing threats by facts. And one of the sad realities of my uh, time in the government is the need to know facts about individuals to determine whether or not they present bona fide threats. We apply an approach which combines law enforcement and law of war, which is what the president has done in the archive speech. And the president has made and lived up to, I think, an absolute commitment to humane treatment in detention. You have heard nothing about torture or other uh, abuses. Now, I think there continues to be a lot of debate over this issue. Um, it will continue for some time, I'm sure. Uh, the fact of the matter is that um, when you are in the job of being in the government, you focus much more on the threats that you read about in the intel and the genuine concerns you have about who might actually be jeopardized. On September 11, 3,000 people in New York were killed for going to work, and that's a human rights violation too. And it's one that uh, I took an oath of office to prevent, but within the framework of the law. So uh, that is our approach. Smart power, engage, translate, and leverage. And it may be that people will disagree as to how it's been applied in any particular circumstance. I actually think it is the only approach that makes sense going forward. I think it's the approach that will guide the next Secretary of State. I think it's, a, it's an approach which is by its definition multilateral because it requires engagement. It's by its definition one that partners because it requires us to work with both public and private entities. It is by its nature one that respects law while trying to adapt old rules and translating them to current circumstances. And it one, it's, it's a, an approach that does not see there as being a single tool to approach our foreign policy. We do not rely simply on law. We do not rely simply on diplomacy. We do not rely simply on uh, development. We do not rely simply on military power. It's something that should be familiar to all of you. I know Dick Holbrook has been mentioned here before. In Bosnia, the notion of diplomacy backed by force is the beginning of a concept that mixes uh, tools and tries to leverage legitimacy into collective responses. So anyway, that gives you uh, a sense. When, when I started in this job, I was told, uh, in any government job, it's a little bit like walking onto a tennis court and being given a tennis racket, and your first day, all you're doing is trying to return the balls. And then after a while, you realize, I shouldn't just be returning the balls. I should be hitting them all in one particular corner. Let me try to hit them all to the right side. But the big moment comes when you say, wait, why am I not the person throwing the balls? <laughs> and why am I not throwing the balls according to a particular strategy? And I've just clarified what that strategy is. Smart power, engage, translate, and leverage. 
and that's the way in which we have sought to use respect for international law to leverage U.S. leadership on human rights. So why don't I take questions here? Uh, the uh, around the room. Um, I want to first, though, say that you know one of the great uh, many great benefits um, of having uh, Harold Coe in the government. You know, you talked about the importance of translation. Um, Harold has been a great translator of U.S. policy for those of us outside of government, and that's really really important. Not just translating it for uh, for Americans, but also for uh, people outside of the United States. A lot of what we've been talking about today and what Human Rights First focuses on is the aspect of American leadership that is leading by example and how important that is. Um, we can have, um, you know, we can say all we want, but if our actions don't, um, don't uh, uh, demonstrate a clear example of leadership on human rights, um, we may turn around and find that we don't have very many people following that, that leadership. So. It's been um, uh, a, a, a wonderful thing for us to have someone of Harold's uh, intellectual and communication gifts to be able to translate U.S. policy uh, for those of us outside the government. Okay, um, raise your hand if you have a question, and I will uh, try to call on you. We have one right up front first. And go ahead and keep raising so I can keep an eye on where, where you are. Hi. Um, very glad to, to be here. It's a great, um, great experience for me to know a lot of things, learn a lot of things today. Um, my question for you is, um, uh, back in October the 3rd, uh, 106 congressmen, they, um, they signed a letter, dear colleague letter, to request um, Secretary Clinton to um, provide info that our State Department, if there is any info about more detailed uh, information about organ harvesting in China. Because uh, there are two books, one is Bloody Harvest, one is uh, State Organs. They all point into the direction that organ harvesting is definitely happened in China to many, many people. And if you are looking at the 2000, at that time, the China's organ transplant is almost zero, very, very low. Now they are the number two in the world. Um, there is an Israel doctor, he find out his patient only takes about two weeks to get, to get a heart transplant done. In our, in our country, it's one to seven years. So um, I would like to know uh, whether we have any info and what make our government holding back because um, I have never been to China, but my heart is for the people. It doesn't matter Chinese people, any people. But I think you know, every day if we are holding that info, our government will be accountable for whatever the people dying every day over there. So that's my sincere thoughts. Well, uh, on the letter itself, um, I'm sure that it's being answered as I speak by someone, and that the process of writing a letter back is as complicated as the process of assembling the letter to write. Um, I think you've identified a important human rights issue, which is not just isolated to any particular country. I mean, we've all heard about organ harvesting issues in Eastern Europe, et cetera. I think what it does illustrate, though, is um, how the engage, translate, and leverage approach works. Question one is um, find out more information from groups and congressional sponsors who raise the issue and identify the scope of the problem and the causes of the problem. That's something, for example, that happened with regard to the issue of trafficking in persons. Is it was put onto the agenda, it was identified as an issue, uh, private and public networks engaged on that issue. The second is to figure out, are there legal norms that are being violated, both domestic and international? That's translate. 
And then the third is how to leverage the U.S. governmental response as part of a broader public-private set of responses. Now, I, I want to point out that this people think correctly that Hillary Clinton has been a huge success as Secretary of State. If you're asking why, it's because she's done exactly this. So let me, let me give an example from a year ago. Uh, LGBT rights. There are many governmental players who refuse to engage on LGBT rights. You know, Hillary Clinton does not have guns, and she does not have... Uh, Navy SEALs at her disposal. She has her diplomatic skills and her commitment to values, her communicative skills. And so what she did was she chose to engage on the issue. What did she do? Translate. Why is that important? Because when she was first lady, she said in Beijing, women's rights are human rights. In other words, she translated the concept of human rights to be broader than just men's rights. And now she translated the concept of human rights to include LGBT rights. Once you do that translation, the entire apparatus of human rights protection that extends to the protection of human rights protects LGBT rights. And third, she engaged with other countries. For example, we're discussing issues in Uganda with regard to their laws with the EU and other like-minded countries, the first LGBT resolution at the Human Rights Council, uh, to try to create a set of norms and principles around this issue. Now, is this issue uh, settled? Of course not. But has it been put on the table through this strategy? Yes, it has. And has that built a basis on which other kinds of uh, institutions and and responses, organizational responses can be developed, yes. So this is a way in which issues that have been previously under-recognized can be taken up um, and uh, a, a coordinated public-private human rights approach pursued as a matter of systematic strategy. Uh, hi, I'm Alexander. Uh, I was a, a lawyer with the Obama campaign. Um, and uh, I just had a two-part question. First of all, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the specifics of how the Office of the Legal Advisor fits into the entire policymaking process at state. And second, um, whether there are any international treaties on the uh, – whether there are any international treaties on the horizon that the administration would like to see the United States ratify. So how does the Office of Legal Advisor um, fit in the policy apparatus? We're a general counsel's office for the State Department. We have about 200 lawyers. Guess how many lawyers the Defense Department has? Try 17,000. What does that tell you? Now, <laughs> um, but what we do is we map onto the State Department's entire agenda. There are 27 offices that cover the functional and um, regional work of the State Department. And so we have a sort of panoramic view of how issues are unfolding. It turns out to be very helpful because an issue like cyberspace, as um, Sarah Labwitz knows, has many dimensions. There are issues of internet freedom, there are issues of intellectual property, there's issues of cyber theft, there's issues of cyber security, there are issues of cyber conflict. Different parts of the government may get together around an issue and focus in on one value and not others. And simply because we're the lawyers for everybody who works on these issues, we have to see all of the issues that are at stake. Now with regard to treaties, um, uh, you know, it shouldn't come as a surprise that in the political environment where you can't get or you're having great difficulty getting 60 votes for um, uh, health care, that it's going to be hard to get 67 votes for a treaty. And so just today, uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities got only 61 votes for advice and consent, um, which I think is a very... Uh, uh, horrible 
result. But since human rights people live in a world where the glass is half full, that means there are only six votes to go. And the real question is how to bring it up again in a different Senate, hold all the 61 who voted yes and get six more. Very often on a vote, you just don't know how many people are gonna vote yes until you vote. So if you can do two, you know exactly who to target. Now another is the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now this is an extraordinary situation. Uh, in 1982, Ronald Reagan decided not to ratify the treaty but accepted much of it as customary law. In the 90s, under the Bush administration, uh, adjustments were made that allowed these to be consistent. Um, every Secretary of State, Republican or Democrat, for the last six or seven has uh, supported the Law of the Sea Convention. And what's increasingly clear is that the Law of the Sea Convention protects our sovereignty and allows us to engage in discussions in places like the Arctic and the South China Sea. And now what's happening is that the very people who are always concerned about our sovereignty are speaking against the treaty as a way of keeping us out of a regime which actually allows us to meaningfully engage on these issues. In other words, anti-internationalism and anti-treaties has completely lost sight of its original purpose, which supposedly was to protect sovereignty. Now, the Law of the Sea Treaty uh, is another treaty that ought to come up very soon. The Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Um, there were hearings on it. I think at the moment uh, there are not 67 votes for it in this Senate. Uh, that could and I hope will change. Um, I've testified for the CEDAW both in my private capacity and as a governmental official. Uh, I'm horrified by the fact that my wife is an Irish American, my daughter is a Korean American, my mother is a Korean. They would all have protections of the CEDAW in Korea or Ireland and they don't have it here which I find outrageous. And it's largely through misinformation, which is um, when I came up for confirmation for my current position, one of the arguments that was made was that I was opposed to Mother's Day. Really? <laughs> <laughs> because the Belarus had come up before the, the uh, uh, Committee for the discrimination, Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. They pointed out that the holiday called Mother's Day in Belarus celebrates stereotypical images of mothers. And they said that this version of Mother's Day was a violation of the treaty or inconsistent with the treaty. This got translated to members of our Senate that the treaty is itself opposed to Mother's Day. So I had to sit there in my own confirmation and hear my, with my mother <laughs> while various senators are telling me that I'm opposed to Mother's Day. My mother is shocked. <laughs> but again, um, there's a level of misunderstanding and disinformation about the value of treaties to us that just has to be overcome. Uh, particularly now treaties on nuclear non-proliferation. Nothing could be more important. In the old days, whatever nuclear weapons were in the ha hands of one or two nations, now as you see, the problem is really one of loose nukes, which means that the proliferation issue is essentially is critical for us to control. And um, I, 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 think, I think that at the end of the day, you have to remember that there are some people who have a 17th century vision of international law as some sort of straitjacket. You know, there, there's a vision. We have freedom, and then law is a straitjacket. So anytime we enter a legal set of norms, it constrains us. Well, I don't know about you, but international law has freed me in my lifetime. Uh, when I was a kid, you could not fly to Europe or to a foreign country. Now I fly to Europe and travel through on a Schengen visa. I go take money out of a ATM machine uh, by using a card. I don't have to use traveler's checks. Um, I have the benefit of diplomatic immunity uh, when I travel. Those are freedoms that are being given to me by a system of international law that gives a kind of certainty and settled expectations. In other words, it's the freedom to engage. 
at Harvard University, they say, you know, the law are wise restraints that make us free. Same is true for international law. So again, those who want to think about international law in 18th century terms, when we're living in the 21st century, really need to re-examine um, the role that law plays in facilitating action in the global environment. Hey, Dr. Koch, Charlie Otstadt. I'm one of the retired admirals and generals that's worked hard on the uh, torture issue, trying to keep that from becoming the norm in the United States. And I wondered if you'd be willing to comment uh, about your optimism about closing Guantanamo and what that strategy might be during the second uh, Obama term. So just, just to um, make it clear, in May of 2010, President Obama made a speech at the National Archives that described a five-part strategy, which was um, uh, Article Three courts, civilian courts, and trials when you can, uh, military commissions when you must, transfers of people who are eligible for transfer, for those who face long-term detention, periodic review, to determine that they are, in fact, dangerous. And fifth, under no circumstances, mistreatment while in detention. That remains the administration policy. So what has happened is that Congress, by enacting various legislative restrictions, as you know, has made it very difficult to do Article III trials, has made it very difficult to move people into the United States, and has made it very difficult to transfer people. And if you have that, you have a different kind of system, which is essentially military commissions on Guantanamo and people not being transferred. So the question now is how to resume. You don't need to change the policy. The policy exists. The question is how to activate the pieces of that policy, the elements that have been stifled. Element number one goes to the National Defense Authorization Act and the restrictions there. The president has indicated or the president's advisors have indicated that they're going to recommend a veto with regard to new restrictions. A second is with regard to resuming trials. A third is re with regard to resuming transfers of people who can be safely transferred. Now on Guantanamo there's a special issue which is um, uh, a group of people from Yemen, which as you know is a country that's engaged now in a very difficult conflict with uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And it is the fact that there are a large number of Yemenis who cannot safely be transferred, which has led to that bucket being stymied. But I think what's critically important is for this, um, for, for these different channels to all be reopened. Uh, it so happens I'm going to Guantanamo tomorrow. I'll be there all day tomorrow. Uh, in fact, it so happens, and Elisa mentioned this or alluded to this, uh, I have been working on issues relating to Guantanamo since 1991. Uh, my birthday is approaching, and this is the 17th birthday out of the last 21 that I'll be working on issues relating to Guantanamo. And I've gone more times than I can count. And I really do think that uh, nobody now argues that Guantanamo is illegal. The question is whether it is a good policy to be holding people long-term offshore, uh, particularly under these kinds of uh, conditions in which they're not being tried, et cetera. And I, I think that the president has made it clear what his policy is. He has now four more years to try to implement that. And quite a few of us um, are working together on it. So what's the best approach? Engage. I think um, the administration needs to hear from those who care that this is an issue worth spending time and capital on. And it deserves its place with the fiscal cliff and uh, other issues that claim primacy in the headlines. Two is what legal rules ought to apply to a place like Guantanamo. Remember, this is one of these places where there was an argument it was a black hole, and through efforts of many, many different people, habeas corpus rules apply. Uh, the administration has required 
humane treatment and banish torture on Guantanamo. And then the question is how to work together multilaterally to solve the problem. The United States cannot close Guantanamo unilaterally. It has to work with many other actors to do so. So again, it's just another example of engage, translate, leverage, uh, but apply to a very difficult and continuing knotty problem. Am I optimistic? <laughs> you know, John Shattuck likes to quote Václav Havel. He says, I'm not an optimist, I'm not a pessimist, uh, but I want to see it done. And this is a president who has on numerous occasions, as you know, repeated his commitment to close it. And on many of those occasions, he could have taken an easy way and, and avoided the question or not addressed it or changed his approach, and he has not done so. Hi, uh, Harold. Uh, Alan Keller from NYU. I, I know you as someone who has dedicated his heart, soul, and essence to combating torture, to speaking out in the last administration about the wrongs that happened. In addition to the, uh, the things you mentioned in terms of engaging, uh, I would add one more, sustain. So my question is, how can we what can the administration do, what should the administration do to sustain uh, the president's commitment that torture not happen again? I am very concerned that with a different election, it, presidential orders come and go. So what sustainable things have happened and need to happen so that we don't go down that road of torture again? Well, it's a good and important question. Uh, the easy answer would have been get legislation, right? Um, I, I think one of the most difficult questions in this environment is are you better off or worse off in taking a matter to the Hill? Is the human rights, uh, is the human rights factor going to be enhanced or diminished by taking it into that forum? And much of what's happened in this administration has been a desire to try to address the issue through executive procedures, to try to institutionalize those procedures with hope that over time those procedures, once institutionalized, can be formalized. But, you know, too often, I, and I have this kind of discussion with my colleagues in the academic world, they talk about bringing Congress into it, to which I say, are we talking about the Congress that you would like to exist or the Congress that in fact exists? I mean, you, you have to play the hand you're dealt, and you have to deal with it, you know. So I ask you the question, Alan, on sustainability. Are we going to sustain the commitment uh, by taking a bill to Congress on torture or not? You know, or are we better off entrenching the rules that the president, by the way, the president has put in the form of executive orders. Those executive orders have led to changes in the field manuals. Those field manuals have led to the way in which those rules are internalized. We have put it into uh, our diplomatic assurances. Uh, dozens of procedures have been changed and adjusted to incorporate the president's directives. We have uh, signed and ratified the Convention Against Torture, and that has been implemented. And then there are other uh, methods by which uh, norms against torture are enforced, criminal legislation, et cetera. My, my academic work is on a very simple point. There, there is a tendency for people to think that uh, the best way to get law enforced is through sanction. John Austin, the philosopher, thought that. My, best, my view is the best way to get uh, rules enforced is through internalization. I wouldn't have recommended legislation. Um, and I do actually think your analogy with uh, uh, the laws of the sea and how human rights becomes normative, uh, just like wearing seatbelts is the norm uh, now. Legislative wasn't what I was referring to. It would have been a much more detailed accounting of what happened. It, in my experience with this, it, it, it's so complex and so interdisciplinary how our country went down this road that it, it was embedded. And so it's not that 
you know, we need a law. It's more that the systems that allowed this to happen need to be held up to the light of day. And I guess I want to ask is, to your satisfaction, has that happened? Um, very few things happened to my satisfaction, Alan. <laughs> I mean, if you're asking whether we should have had a truth commission, that was clearly a proposal that Senator Leahy put on the table at the beginning of the administration, and it didn't get much uptake. Um, is it over? Um, you know, I think w one of the issues for the election was that had the election gone one way, human rights people would have been fighting a major battle to prevent backsliding. Now that it's gone the other way, the question is how to pocket what you've got and keep moving forward, right? And that means that um, the importance for groups that care about particular issues to develop a clear, clean, focused legislative strategy and also most important to develop priorities is, is incredibly important. And because, you know, people will say to you correctly um, what you saw, in an environment where there's X amount of political capital to get things done, where do you spend it? And, you know, it's a good question. Um, so I think um, any number of groups, and I know Human Rights First with its blueprints are among them, are in the very process of trying to identify strategies and priorities. And the question is how to get them out there. I mean, right now, everybody in Washington is talking about getting jobs. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a very funny uh, situation where people ca call you up and they want to eat lunch and then they say, you know, what have you heard? <laughs> and the, the basic answer is, um, you know, the people who know aren't talking and the people who talk don't know. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it is a very hilarious uh, situation in Washington because depending on who gets this, then there's a sort of domino effect in many. In, so we're in this uh, transition, even though the administration is staying in place and until different seats are filled and you know who's going to do what, it's, it's very difficult to know who are going to be your partners and what the points of leverage are. And then that has to work together with identifying a set of priorities. Section over here. Uh, Sarah Trister with Freedom House. Thank you for the discussion. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about some locations, some countries where the engage, translate, and leverage approach maybe hasn't been as successful. Um, and if there will be a rethinking and new approach to some of these uh, situations in the new, uh, new term, um, particularly I'm thinking of places like Russia, Bahrain, to some extent Egypt, um, and what can be done to address some of the particularly human rights issues in these countries uh, in a way that might be more successful than has been done over the past four years. Well, I think we, what we're seeing in Arab Awakening is not that dissimilar to what we saw in the Balkans, which it turns out that, um, you know, authoritarian governments preserve a certain kind of stability. So even uh, when, when those authoritarian governments collapse, Tito or whatever, suddenly um, a whole set of forces are unleashed that nobody expected. Now, this afternoon, you gave at lunch an award to the Bahrain Human Rights Center. You've seen the challenges that they faced. Egypt, you know, only it was only a while ago that, you know, Tahir Square is a good place to see where the demonstrations occur because they were demonstrating against Mubarak, and then they were demonstrating about the role of the military, and then they were demonstrating uh, about other aspects of Arab Spring. Now they're demonstrating about the changes in the Constitution. Um, there is an important issue, which is if you want the people to govern themselves, you do have to support them in their efforts to do so. But on the other hand, often that means different kinds of individuals assume power and authority after the vacuum closes up. Oligarchs or uh, uh, sometimes there are leaders who you know, perpetuate themselves in power by various devices, et cetera. I think the only thing that we can do is stay focused on civil society. Um, you know, there are places where there are virtually no civil society organizations or where the civil society organizations have been systematically stamped out. 
Worse than that, there are many countries where there are a lot more guns and man pads and weapons uh, than there is money for any kind of human development. So you end up seeing weapons flowing, say, to the Tuaregs in Mali, thus causing internal instability and threatening the government in Bamako. So to engage, you do need to have people to engage with. That's what made Burma an unusual case. There is no Aung San Suu Kyi in every country in the world that has been experiencing authoritarian leadership. You know, every person is not uh, Nelson Mandela in waiting. When I was the Assistant Secretary for the Human Rights Bureau, my office used to say to me, Harold, today's Democrats are here. <laughs> and then people would come in from country X who would describe themselves and their ambitions for bringing democracy to the country. Then a number of years later, you would see that they had fax machines and suits made in London, but you didn't see a lot of democracy flowing to the people. So um, on the other hand, I think we've become more experienced uh, on engaging on these um, infrastructure issues, civil society organizations, labor unions, women's groups, press, labor unions, rule of law, bar associations, etc. And it requires a long-term commitment. It also requires money, uh, which is the reason why uh, the systematic shrinking of resources toward these smart power goals has made it difficult to, to pursue. So um, again, I think it's, it's something where one reason why I'm so, such an admirer of Hillary Clinton is that what she has done has been really with remarkably few resources other than her own energy, public visibility, willingness to speak out, and indefatigability, uh, been able to really create a sort of diplomatic uh, surge uh, on a whole set of issues. And a different Secretary of State may not have been able to accomplish the same thing. I think we have one more question back here. Hi, I'm Kaylin Kochak from the Fund for Global Human Rights. Um, appreciate your time today. Um, my question is um, about drone strikes or targeting, as you, um, I think, called it. Uh, I know you said you get asked about this a lot, and I think that's um, maybe primarily because you have had, you have been such a stellar champion of human rights and have um, such a good record with regard to international law that people are surprised um, by your defense of these strikes, which, in my mind, are. Um, a very egregious error, very much in contradiction with international law, one which we know takes the lives of innocent people, and one which many people, myself included, believe um, is making us actually less safe, um, and in addition have has further uh, expanded executive power, um, which is something we know the administration itself believes, as it came out in the press uh, recently, that uh, they tried to codify constraints in anticipation of a uh, potential Romney victory recently. Um, and you yourself, I think, several years ago had called these types of strikes extrajudicial killings. And so I'm just wondering if you could possibly um, sort of discuss your, your, the evolution of your thinking on this issue. Yeah, so I, I never did, and so I love being misquoted. But first, and most important, most of the stories on this capture a piece of the truth. But let, let's go back to a very basic fact. Uh, all killing is regrettable. Not all killing is illegal. In armed conflict, the rules of armed conflict exist for the very purpose of defining lawful versus unlawful killing. Killing in armed conflict is by its nature extrajudicial. So what makes something immoral or illegal is whether it's done outside the rules. And the basic frame which this administration put forward. By the way, the last administration stated no particular frame, but the frame that we put forward was basically very simple. Go back and read President Obama's Nobel Prize lecture, where he says, I'm a man of peace. I happen to be commander in chief of country in war. Uh, a non-state actor, Al Qaeda, attacked us, and it's continuing to attack us. And I therefore am in the awkward position of accepting a peace prize while I happen to be engaged in the activity of defending the country 
in armed conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, and against al-Qaeda and its associated forces. Now, a very simple question is, would it be lawful in the context of an armed conflict if an enemy combatant leader or an enemy belligerent leader, as in Pearl Harbor, attacks U.S. soil and kills 3,000 civilians, in the context of the armed conflict against Japan, that is exactly what the United States did. Congress declared war. The president and the commanders pursuant to that power went out, and in the context of that armed conflict, they attacked and they killed the person who had done Pearl Harbor. And they did it based on the notion that that person was planning future attacks. That rationale is what was applied with regard to bin Laden. Now, um, th this may not go over well, but I say it anyway. I, I think that many in academia, my own colleagues, do not believe that if we did not do many of the things that we would do, that there would actually be additional attacks. And you would have no reason to know because you actually don't necessarily have all of the information that I have to read every day. But it is pretty clear that Al-Qaeda and its associated forces are planning attacks constantly. And they would come here and kill me, and they'd kill my children on our soil. Um, and that in the course of the time that I've been working in office, we had uh, you know, bombs in Times Square in a, a vehicle. We have had um, a uh, underwear bomb. We have had uh, cartridge bombs. We have had uh, another kind of underwear bomb. Um, these various attacks or efforts have been thwarted, but they continue. And there are people in these organizations who spend all their time planning these attacks. That this is this is their their job. Um, and they are identifiable, knowable individuals. Uh, this is not a general uh, war against terror. It's a declared armed conflict for the authorization of use of military force against a non-state actor that operates across borders that calls itself al-Qaeda that has identifiable wings like al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, etc. So what has been done in the course of that armed conflict is a combination of detention and targeting, particularly when those individuals are outside the United States. Um, what I have done in a number of settings is to express that legal framework. I do think the United States has a right to engage in this armed conflict. I think it's lawfully triggered that armed conflict by uh, statute. Uh, I think it is consistent with the rules of international humanitarian law. Uh, I think that the detentions are being also done consistently with those rules. If they were not, I would resign. And I don't lightly defend them, because I know I'm probably the most liberal person who does defend them. But uh, it does seem to me that, um, and, and it's good also, by the way, to challenge the way administrations do things to demand more transparency, et cetera. I, I completely agree with that. I think that the press has done a good job uh, in bringing out the details, et cetera. But uh, I, I think that there's a, a kind of category error going on in certain respects. And, and let me give you two examples of these category errors. Number one, no one asked George Washington, give me your target list or bring them before a court. Why not? He was in an armed conflict. Or say to him, well, you just killed the British soldier. That's an extrajudicial killing. He's in an armed conflict. A war has been declared. In an armed conflict, there's a line between the legal and the illegal. A second point, which I just again make to this audience, because I think you need to have an answer, is that many, many people who've expressed comfort or approval or whatever with the use of atomic weapons to end uh, World War II, uh, which are inherently indiscriminate, inherently non-proportional devices, uh, don't revisit that concern at the time in which they're speaking about the technology of drones or other things. The, the fact of the matter is that drones are just the latest technology. 
military force as it has been used over the centuries has been increasingly more remote and increasingly more targeted. And um, if you're wondering what the next technology, you know, whether, whether we're talking about catapults or bombs uh, or guided missiles, uh, that is a very big feature of how warfare has evolved. Now, the laws of war have also evolved and follow those. That's what I call the translation exercise. I spend a lot of my time, more than I would care to, addressing the question of whether certain targets are lawful or not. I have never signed off on a target that I thought was unlawful because I have an oath to uphold the laws and constitution of the United States of America. And I wouldn't. But I also think it's a human rights violation to kill innocent civilians on U.S. soil for going to work. Uh, and that's uh, part of what the, the exercise is. Uh, when I go back to private life, which I will at some point, I'm going to ask everybody a question, which is very simple. I appreciate the things you don't like about what's being done. Tell me what you would do and how it would be better and how you would get it done. And unless you provide that as a solution and figure out how it's going to happen, then you have to work on how to get that to happen. I think we live in a world where it's too easy to say, I mean, and you're entitled to, I don't like how things are happening. But you do have to frame, if you were in this job, what would you do instead? You know, President Obama has a important job, which is not just rebuilding the economy. He needs to protect American citizens from being attacked on U.S. soil by people applying to do so. And this has been his approach, and my job has been uh, to put into a legal frame, to engage, to translate, and to do leverage on it. So I, I'm, I'm often asked, um, do you feel uncomfortable saying things you don't believe? And the answer is, I don't know, because I've never done it. Um, my own view is I have tenure at a leading university. I would not speak in favor of legality, something I thought was illegal. Um, I do not think that our uh, program is illegal by design. Uh, there may have been accidents or mistakes, and those ought to be addressed and investigated. But I think that the approach is one that polices the line between lawful and unlawful killing uh, which is exactly what happens in a situation of armed conflict and self-defense. And I think um, th that is the frame in which uh, people are offering. Now, you can challenge that. You can say it's a bad piece of translation. You can say that it ought to be put into a different kind of frame. You could say that the rules aren't clearly enough articulated. We can have good faith discussions about all of this. But I, I think, again, for the human rights community, we can preserve law, support human rights, and protect ourselves. And the question is how to do that uh, in a way that juggles these complex values. Thank you, Harold. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here and staying here for this fascinating discussion. Um, I think we should wrap it up now. And I just want to say that, um, Harold, engage translate and leverage. I think that describes what you were just doing with us uh, this afternoon and a masterful job of it. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us to do it. Thank you. Sure.